Okay, very good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to week nine of quantum field theory. Uh, in some sense, this is the most exciting uh, calculation in the subject. And it is Schwinger's famous calculation of the magnetic moment of the electron, which, what did he write on his tombstone? Yes, this is engraved on his tombstone, this alpha over two pi, which was the factor that he derived as the correction to the magnetic moment. Uh, there was also a very famous light, and I'm also a little partial to Schwinger because he's a Columbia, he was a Columbia sort of alumni. He did all of his stuff at Columbia. And uh, uh, there was a very famous Life Magazine article that had a picture of him. He was sort of a charismatic guy. It's a shame that people don't remember him, but they remember Feynman, but that's just how these things go. And uh, uh, the famous caption was his, the lab, his laboratory was his ballpoint pen. So that's sort of a famous line, but because uh, at that time, theoretical physics was sort of, Einstein had made it a thing, right? There was not really a thing, such thing as theoretical physics until Einstein. And then uh, it became sort of like cool to be a theoretical physicist when these guys were doing these very famous calculations that made national headlines. So I am literally going to do the whole calculation. It is a hard calculation. It's not an easy one, but my feeling is you should see it because it's one of really, it's one of the big, uh, it, it, it's really the calculation that solidified that this is the right theory to work with. Up until this point, QED was being developed. There were still some doubts, but this calculation when he announced, so he announced this discovery at the American Physical Society in New York City, which I was very surprised to read that they had APS meetings in New York City because it's very expensive. Nowadays, they have APS meetings in like Texas or, you know, Florida or, but it seems like back in the day in the 40s, this was in 1948, they had it in New York City and it was a huge riveting thing. Uh, there, I read a story from some guy saying everyone just burst into applause when he derived this factor. So I'm just gonna do the whole calculation today. Uh, Johnson is gonna cover Bremsstrahlung. I'm not going to because uh, it, it's a very nasty calculation. I tried working it out again and it was very nasty. So I don't really, <laughs> I kind of got a sense of that last week but when I worked out more carefully, I, I started to realize this is not something I should really cover. And then next, so the, today will be the last day of QED. And then uh, Johnson will cover vacuum polarization next week, which is also QED. And then we're gonna do renormalization. Then we'll do Yang-Mills theory, the weak interaction, symmetry breaking. And yeah, so we're done with QED. Uh, your homework. Uh, so Lancaster Blundell, uh, 23 and 24, and this is on the uh, Feynman path integral. So we haven't really talked about the path integral yet, but we're going to at some point. So if you are a little uh, still confused, I would read chapter 22 again, because that's a very important concept that uh, the, the idea of a generating functional that will make these two things clear. Okay, what else did I wanna say? Okay, uh, those of you in the little GR thing we're doing, which is all of you pretty much, I'm do, we're doing the Einstein equations tomorrow, so that should be good. Okay, okay, very good. Any questions from last time before we get started on this beast? It's gonna take us the whole time, so. I don't think your video is pinned. Oh, it's not? Okay, thank you. Yes, let me do that. There, it should be good now. Oh, that always happens. And then like in the first five minutes of the recording, it's like going everywhere, the camera, so. Okay, so let's talk about the history of the magnetic moment. Okay, like what, what is the history? So the first person to actually compute a magnetic moment was Dirac. Shouldn't be surprising, Dirac did a lot of things. Uh, and he did this with quantum mechanics. He computed the magnetic moment with quantum mechanics, okay? 
non-relativistically, no quantum field theory, brute force. It's a very, very, it, when I say the field theory calculation is bad, the quantum mechanics one is just as bad. It's just uh, less elegant. Uh, and he wrote down a Hamiltonian that described the magnetic moment. So he wrote down a Hamiltonian that went like this, P, P hat squared plus 2m plus some V of R. And then, so this stuff is just standard. Nothing here is, well, I should just make this a vector and I'll take the hat off this. This stuff is just standard. This is not sort of uh, anything fancy. And then he gets this extra additional correction term, E over 2m, B. B, is the, B is the magnetic field in this situation. Dotted with L plus GS. Okay, so what do I mean by all this? So this is the Hamiltonian he writes down to compute the magnetic. So this stuff is standard. This is just quantum mechanics, a potential plus just a free particle energy. And then this is like the correction term he gets. So this B is the magnetic field. So of course, a magnetic, what is a magnetic moment? Okay, we should probably say that. A magnetic, you can imagine a particle as like a magnet, okay, literally a magnet. It has some magnetic field around it. And, and the magnetic moment tells you how strong of a magnet is the particle, okay? So electrons have some strength to them, okay? Uh, muons have a different magnetic moment. They have a different strength, okay? And how do you get that? Well, L is your uh, standard orbital angular momentum and S is your spin angular momentum, okay? So if you dot the magnetic field with the angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, you get the magnetic moment. If you need more physics on magnetic moments, just go into Griffith's E and M or something and, and he'll tell you what this means physically. The important thing to note though, and this is what Dirac figured out, was that if you notice L, the regular orbital angular momentum is just L, okay, B dot L, but plus G times S, that somehow actually the spin angular momentum has this funny G factor in front of the S, okay? And Dirac figured out that G was equal to two, okay? And so what Dirac really figured out, and it's a long argument, I mean, some quantum mechanics books will have it. It's sort of not a standard thing to teach. Uh, Dirac figured out that actually the spin angular momentum is placed is two times as strong, is two times stronger, sorry, than the regular uh, orbital angular momentum. And so this, yes. Like, wait, I just wanted to like uh, make clear, magnetic moment is spin, right? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can kind of call it spin, kind of. But, yeah. Okay, if not, what's the actual difference between spin and magnetic moment? Well, the only reason I, I hesitate a little bit uh, a little bit to just say spin, because in this context, we also have an orbital angular momentum term, right? There isn't just contribution from the spin. See, if this was the only contribution, you'd be totally right. But you have to remember there's an extra contribution here. So it is spin. You can you can like say it's like spin with an extra. extra. Okay, and what is that? Like why there is such contribution? I just remember how, like in this Terrell Gerl experiment, we just like we were thought that told that spin is just like magnetic moment and consider this. Yes, yes, good. So to get to the to get to this calculation is quite a bit of work. We can do it, uh, and uh, we can do it. I can show you it at another time. But you're absolutely right. It is not at all obvious. First of all, it's not at all obvious that you get an L. That's the first thing that you get some other contribution. And moreover, it's even more uh, less, it's even stranger that you get this G factor in front of the S. So yes, you're right to be a little mystified by this, but that's okay. We can derive it another time if you're, if you're interested because it's a long calculation, but yes. But uh, if you just, uh, for, for the moment at least, just accept that this is how it is. That's how it is. But you should definitely look into the derivation for sure, for sure. Uh, so he gets that uh, this two in front of the S. 
which is also why in a lot of just uh, rudimentary discussions, you ignore the L, just because the contribution from spin angular momentum is so much more apparent. And so this was his correction. And when they computed the magnetic moment, as they got more and more sophisticated in their experiments, they found out this was not correct, that it was just an approximation. Okay, and so we knew it's kind of like in general relativity, right, where the precession of the orbit of Mercury was like a little off, right, so they knew they needed a new theory of gravity. This is a similar situation. We knew we needed a relativistic theory of quantum mechanics to solve this problem. Enter quantum field theory, enter Schwinger. Okay, okay, excellent. So uh, again, uh, in this context, just for your own reference, S equals one half sigma, right? Just depending on whatever uh, spin basis you're working in. Okay. And G is called the coupling. Okay. You, you use G as a coupling or we call it a G factor, okay, of the electron. Okay. So it's the strength of the spin orbit coupling. Okay. So Dirac calculated two, but he did not get the full quantum corrections. Uh, there was still uh, some stuff missing. So let's motivate, let's motivate the quantum field theory. Let's motivate the quantum field theory calculation. But you're absolutely right. Check that derivation. See how you get the factor of L and uh, 2S. It's not at all obvious. No way. Okay. So the question now, uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about charged spinner particles and write down a Dirac equation that looks like this. I D cross, so this is a covariant derivative, right? Minus M psi equals zero. So this is my Dirac equation in sort of its most basic uh, gauge invariant form. Okay, when I say that, does that mean something to you after you read about gauge theory a little bit in the textbook? Okay, okay, this is just your covariant derivative, okay, but with a with a little gamma matrix derivative. Okay, if this if this looks a little confusing, then you should reread chapter fourteen, where, where they talk about gauge theory. Okay, and then this is sort of the what happens when I square this guy, okay? So I just square this guy and I get that, okay? The reason we're doing this is we have to motivate what we want to actually calculate, okay, in the quantum field theory sense. It's not at all obvious what we need to calculate to calculate the magnetic moment, okay? We have no idea, so we need some motivation, okay? Where I define D cross square, this like a gauge covariant derivative in the following way, Okay. And I define it as d mu squared plus e f mu nu sigma mu. Okay. Sorry, e over two, where f mu nu is equal to. Uh, I think i i over two i. Uh, yes, I over two gamma mu, gamma mu, okay? So this is all sort of, this is also covariant derivative, by the way. So this is all sort of setting up the problem. All the, co you can basically, I can put in a covariant derivatives if because if, if, I'm if you if you're a little unfamiliar with why I'm using them, they impose gauge invariance. Okay, you get a little extra term from it that just imposes gauge invariance. So it's just something to think about. Okay, so then this equation uh, become this equation becomes this, and I have d mu squared plus e over two f mu nu sigma mu nu plus m squared psi equals zero. Now, take a look at the construction I'm creating. This f mu nu is made up of gamma matrices, and this sigma mu nu is made up of Pauli spin matrices, which that combination is very familiar in uh, quantum field theory. 
that this combination, this is not your standard ENM. Uh, what is it called? Field strength tensor. Okay, this is not your standard F mu nu. I've defined it in a different way. I'm just putting that out there. Okay, so this term is really the term that captures the spin. And you will see how that works, okay? This is the extra junk. These two terms are standard, and then this term is the extra junk. Okay. This encodes the difference between a spinner field and an electromagnetic field. For example, if I just had the scalar variant of this equation, it would just look like this, okay? I would get no uh, E over two F mu nu sigma mu nu term. Is that somehow intuitively okay, even if you don't know the mechanics? That somehow this extra term is what's gonna make or break us, okay? In this construction. Okay, furthermore, we can define uh, this guy in the, uh, the, the while representation in the following way. So F mu nu, sigma mu nu. So now what is F mu nu? What is the combination of F mu nu, sigma mu nu, right? I, sa I said it's gonna define our story about spin. So I get a minus C out front. And what are we gonna get in this matrix? We better get things that tell us about spin. So here I'm gonna get a B plus IE. This is an E field. And here I'm gonna get a B minus I and the rest are just zeros, obviously. And here I'm gonna get a B minus I in this matrix, okay? And these guys are acting on sigma. Okay, so you can do this. You should work out this combination. Take F mu nu. Take, uh, take sigma mu nu, you know what sigma mu nu is, right? In our standard QED notation and see if you get this, this matrix out. Okay. okay, great. Is this all okay? This is sort of just motivating something, uh, which is motivating. This is just kind of just setting up the problem. We know the problem is gonna lie here, okay? And so, now let's see how much we can extract from this. And you also have to remember, I'm teaching you this, uh, this was done in 1948. So I'm teaching you this 70 years after the fact. So it seems all obvious, easy. Uh, this took a long time to figure out. This, these things were not <laughs> sort of like black and white where they just said, oh yeah, okay, great. You like this? Term. No, no, no. These things took a lot of guesswork, okay? a lot of thinking. Uh, so, so sometimes it's just important to remind yourself as students that it's okay if you need to do the thinking after. It's okay. <laughs> you don't need to get it right away. Very good. Okay, so now I'm just going to write this equation in momentum space because it's going to be easier for me to do all of my Feynman diagrammatics, which uh, I give a full disclaimer. Schwinger did not draw any Feynman diagrams but we will, we will, because it makes it more intuitive, but he did not, I can, I can guarantee that. Okay, so in momentum space then, I can write down this guy. Okay, now that we know what all the pieces are, uh, and this implies the following. Okay, so now I'm gonna write this guy in momentum space. Okay, this is a very, uh, this calculation I wrote down specially. So I'm just gonna use what I wrote down so I don't make sign errors. So in momentum space, this looks like this, minus E square over two M psi equals M over two. P minus E A squared over two M minus two E over two M e dot S minus I M e dot S. So basically what I've done, I've written out the whole thing, okay? 
And I've written out, well, I should actually probably have the F mu nu, sigma mu nu term here because I've just written out everything okay. in momentum space. This will become apparent in a second. Uh, so let's compare this to the first equation we wrote down. And we can see that uh, this looks very similar to sort of the first Hamiltonian we wrote down. So let's, let's put that down. Let me just make sure I did this in the right form. Minus two B dot S. Yes, good. Okay, so this is our basic equation we want to work with. And of course, we're going to want to calculate these kinds of terms here. These are our magnetic moment terms, so to speak. Whereas these are our like standard terms. Okay. So what are we trying to calculate in QFT that's going to tell us about the magnetic moment? What is the actual like phenomena that's going to give us the answer, right? It's, it's, there's got to be some physical process. And don't worry if this is unclear. It's going to make sense as we go through the actual calculation. This is sort of just setting it up. Okay. And what we want to consider is some electron sort of moving in space, scattering at some angle, and radiating a photon. So it turns out, and this is something that took a lot of trial and error, it turns out that the photon radiating gives you the correction to the magnetic moment at the vertex. Okay, so what Dirac was missing was a radiating photon, which is, which is a minor correction, but it makes a big difference in the experimental data, okay? So a good way to think about photon corrections to spinners, right? Because we're gonna have spinners that are colliding with each other. Electrons are spinners, right? So a good way to think about corrections is to consider off-shell S matrix elements, okay? So all I mean when I say off-shell is to consider photons where PI squared equals mi squared, okay? This whole time we've been working on shell where this does not hold. Okay. Good. So what's the process we wanna consider? We wanna consider some electron E minus with a momentum Q, right? With a radiating photon that can be described by a gauge field A mu, go into some electron E minus with a momentum Q2. Is this okay? Okay, after this step, I hope you understand everything. Up to now, it's sort of been a little muddy. You'll see why. This is the first <laughs> physical thing, I'm very physical thing I'm writing down in the Q of T realm. Okay, and of course, this photon has a polarization vector epsilon mu of P, and of course, we have two spinners, u bar of q2 and u of q1, right? Because u bar is the outgoing electron, u is the ingoing electron. Okay, have I set up the physical problem? Okay. Okay, so let's, of course, we're going to need this calculation at tree level first. So let's do this at tree level. It's, it's trivial. So you have two particles, q1, q2 and you have a radiating photon P, okay? And so you have epsilon, some polarization, epsilon mu, M mu naught, okay? And if I write down the amplitude I, M mu, zero. Zero, why did I write zero? Because this is the tree level process, okay? That's the only reason I put down a zero. And what do I get if I just use the Feynman rules? I get minus I E, U bar of Q2, gamma mu, 
mu of q1, where p mu equals q mu2 minus q mu1. Is this okay? This is just a standard amplitude. I have a vertex here. I have two spinners for the outgoing and the ingoing particle. My vertex factor is minus i e gamma mu, and I have no propagator. Okay, and I'm and I'm telling, and then p mu momentum conservation. Okay, is conserved at the vertex. So p is for the photon momentum, q is for the electron momentum. Is this okay? Okay, this is very trivial. This is this is silly, and in fact, you find that this contributes to the first term in that uh, expression. This gives you no idea of any magnetic moment. Okay, at tree level, you get Dirac. You get Dirac and you're happy and you think Dirac is right and you don't need quantum field theory. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna have to go to loop level, unfortunately. That's the only way we can do this calculation. At tree level, this is it. Anybody can write this in a second and you're done. Suffice to say, Schwinger did not draw this. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of, you know, doing the wrong thing there, but. Okay, very good. Okay, so. Uh, now we, we know that we're gonna have to go to loop level. We did the tree level calculation. We know what process we need to compute. It's fine. It seems okay, right? So, Again, I'm going to keep only the photon off shell. Okay, and I'm gonna have the electrons on shell. And we're gonna need this identity called the Gordon identity between spinners, which you can I can send you my derivation of this identity. So what does the Gordon identity say? It looks like this. Sorry. Q. Oh God, Q2 mu. Some some field theory textbooks have this. I don't know if Lancaster has this identity. Gamma mu Q1 plus I mu bar Q2 sigma mu mu Q1 mu minus Q2 mu. Okay, this is called the Gordon identity. It's just an identity between spinners, which allows us to rewrite the tree level amplitude in the following way, just using the Gordon identity. So if I rewrite this amplitude, the tree level amplitude, just employing this, I get the following. And I'll tell you why this is important. Okay, why is this important? I'm trying to think of a textbook that derives this. I'm pretty sure if you look up derivation of the Gordon identity, you'll find it. I think I did it for a homework problem at some point. I don't even remember. It's too long for me. I don't even remember what I ate for lunch last week. So you're telling me to remember a derivation from two and a half years ago now. Okay, so all I've done is some algebra to rewrite the amplitude using this identity. Okay, I, I really have not done anything crazy. But I say but because you have not seen the derivation for this. So look it up. <laughs> but you know, but this has stunning consequences. Why? Okay, you should you should be saying why. Uh, and uh, it gives us like this extra junk term that is, is going to be very useful to what we're trying to do. And this is kind of those of you that are, I don't know what math you're all taking, you, but you'll find that identities are very powerful because they give you new relationships between things. So let's let's look at the first term. This first term is just 
whatever. Nothing interesting here. Okay, this is like a standard amplitude term. You just get some weird momentum thing here. Big deal. This second term is really cool. Why? Why is the second term really cool? Because it's spin dependent. I have a P and U sigma mu. This is spin dependent. So this is the term that's going to give us the magnetic moment. We're going to see this explicitly in a second. But this is spin dependent, which is very important for what we're trying to do. If it, if it, if it didn't give us a spin dependent term, we wouldn't care. OK, so now the, the, the question now that we need to ask is how is P nu sigma mu nu modified at loop level? OK, because this is still tree level. So now, the, or sorry, u bar sig p nu sigma mu nu u. That's the question now. The, and watch, you guys are all confused now, I know. In, in 10 minutes, I'm going to make the question so explicit that you won't be as confused, OK? Just give it another 10 minutes. Those of you that are coming to the GR classes, you're probably like, yeah, now I know why QFT is so much harder. All the calculations are so much worse than GR. <laughs> OK, so but but anyways, this is this is the question we need to resolve. What happens to this guy at loop level? And you should intuitively be saying that we're going to have to invoke this Gordon identity again. So we can't just throw it away. OK. Can I erase the board? Very good. Good. So now I'm going to do something kind of, I really hate to say this word. This is, so when I was running through this calculation, I said, okay, what's the easiest way uh, for me to frame this, to frame this calculation? And uh, this is the best way I could do it. So, so I'm going to write down some amplitude. Okay. Are we okay with that? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I don't. Okay, I'm gonna write some general amplitude for, for this process, okay? So we have Q1 goes to blob, goes out. Okay, and then we have some momentum. Oh, I'm gonna redraw that. Okay, so we have some arbitrary scattering process. Okay, it could be anything because now I know I need some loop correction, right? And I'm gonna write this in a general form. So I know I need a spinner and I'm gonna put some random F1, which could be some random loop correction, gamma mu plus F2, P mu plus F3, Q1 mu plus F4, Q2 mu. U of Q1. Okay, is this okay? I'll tell you what I did here. I sort of tried to write the most general amplitude possible. So what are the things I know I'm going to need in the amplitude? Q mu two, Q mu one, P mu, Gamma on you. Okay, those those four things I need, and the Fs are dependent on what's happening in the blob, right? Is there a propagator? Is there a loop correction? Is there an extra vertex factor? <laughs> you know what's going on here, okay? So I and, and I know I need two spinners. Okay. So I've written the most general amplitude. Okay, we can do some algebra now to simplify this guy. And uh, sort of put it in a in a more usable form. Okay, what I'm trying to say is, we can write this in such a way to knock out two of these forms. Uh, oh, sorry, I used term jargon. So these f's are called form factors. Okay, in the in the literature. So see, I automatically used it. I didn't even tell you what it is. Okay, so. Now I can use it. So we can do some algebra to knock out two of these form factors. We can just 
knock them out. So I'm going to do a bunch of algebra now, like a ninja. Uh, you're going to have to go through it yourself, as with most things. Okay, so let's do it. So I can now start writing out this expression again. So F1 gamma mu plus F3 Q1 mu plus F4 Q mu 2 u. How did I write it in this form? I used the ward identity to put it in this form. Namely, the ward identity allows me to pull out this P mu. Okay. So it's now P mu times an amplitude, right? What does the word identity allow me to do? The word identity says that K mu, M, uh, M mu equals zero, where K mu is a, what is K mu? It's a photon momenta or an off shell momenta. Sorry, here I put the photon on shell, but whatever. It's the virtual particle momenta, okay? So I just pulled out the P mu, which corresponds to the photon. That's just the word identity. Am I okay there? And now this whole guy is the amplitude. Okay. And now uh, we can do some of this multiplication and distribution, right? Which is gonna be complicated. So if you do all of the multiplication, you get F1, U bar, P slash. Where, what is P slash? Do we remember our Feynman slash notation? P slash is just P mu gamma mu. Is that okay? That's why when I multiply the P mu by this, I get a P slash. Cool? I'm just multiplying this guy out. I'm just doing some basic algebra. I'm not, I'm not doing anything mysterious yet. Okay, U plus P dot Q1, F3 U bar U plus p dot q2, f4, u bar u, okay? So this is what I get just by literally multiplying this guy out. Remember, there's a u here. So I do u times f4 times u bar times p mu. So I dot the p and the q. Is this okay? Are you sure? I'm just, I'm just multiplying it out. Okay, good. Okay, let's do some more simplification. So step one, I use the word identity. Step two, I have multiplied it out using the slash notation. And I'm working off a general amplitude. The mo I, my, my goal was to write down the most general amplitude possible. This was the expression I tried to play around with. I think Schwinger did it a different way in his paper. I'm not sure though. I should probably read it again. You should read that paper also, all of you. Okay, can I erase the board? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, so we use the board identity and we use that other, just, just algebra. So uh, again, I have the expression F1 U bar P slash U plus P dot Q1 F3 U bar U plus P dot Q2, F4, U bar U. Okay, that, that was what I just wrote down. Okay. Now I can uh, manipulate this some more. Let me just make sure I did this right. Yes, good. So I can add these two terms and I get P dot Q1, F3, U bar U, plus P dot Q2, F4, U bar U. Uh, this guy, why did I let that drop out? That's a, that's a gamma U, P U, U, U bar. Yeah, let's just ignore that. Let's look at this guy first. I'm just ignoring that. So no equals. Just look at these two, these two terms. And if you look at these two terms, you find that P dot Q1 equals Q2 dot Q1, which is fine. That's just uh, minus M squared, sorry. Okay, 
which equals minus p dot q2. I'm just using conservation of momentum law, momentum law here to make these equal. And therefore, I can set f3 equal to f4, those two form factors. Why? Forget this argument. Let's just look at this. I have two spinners, u bar u, OK? I have two form factors, OK? I have p dot q2 and p dot q1. What does conservation of momenta tell me? Here's P1, here's Q, here's P2. P dot, P, P1 dot Q is what? P1 dot Q is this calculation, right? You're taking this component of the momenta and dotting it with that, right? Because these are four vectors. So this is like P mu dotted with Q mu, P mu one, fair? Is that okay? Now I take the outgoing momenta P2 mu, and dot it with Q mu. Again, conservation momentum, these two things better be equal. If they're not, we're gonna have a problem, right? Because the ingoing momenta better equal the outgoing momenta. These two dot products better be equal, therefore F3 equals F4, whatever those form factors are. So this is kind of awesome, right? You take a generalized expression, even if you don't know anything about the process, I've gotten rid of the F3 and F4. Okay, by some sleight of hand algebra. Okay, are we okay? Okay. Okay, so that means we only have to compute two form factors, F1 and F2. So we, we're simplifying the problem. And uh, so, so that's good. So now we only have to compute two form factors, F1 and F2. And uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to use the Gordon identity again. So using the Gordon identity, I can write the amplitude of the two form factors in the following way. Now I'm capitalizing the F because it's more important now. Okay, that's just my decision. get a relatively simple expression, okay? We get something kind of nice here. Something also to keep in mind as when, when you start doing more rigorous calculations, see what you can do, just play around with things, right? Because it's, it's never obvious what to do mathematically. Or sometimes it might be obvious what to do mathematically, but then there's a saying that the problem just probably isn't hard enough. <laughs> it's like, if you know what to do then. Okay, now, can someone intuitively tell me, just based on everything we've been discussing? Yes, I know, I'm, I'm asking questions, crazy. The question I have is, I have two form factors, F1 and F2. They're my unknowns, okay? Going back to algebra class, right? They are going to make or break us here. Okay. I also told you that one term was going to be crucial to the magnetic moment or one combination of terms. So if you were to guess what form factor is going to really, what is the form factor we're going to have to compute to get this answer? That's that's what we need to ask. So what do we think? We only have two choices. F2. Yes, thank you, good. It wasn't a hard question, right? Because you have the sigma mu nu p nu term here, right? And that is, this is not even really interesting at all. This is just gonna give you some normal thing. This is kind of interesting. So we have reduced the question again. The question is, what is F2? And that was the question Schwinger answered. What is F2? That is the question we need to answer. That's what we have to compute now, okay? At tree level, at tree level, F1 equals one, you just get this, right? At tree level, and F2 equals zero. 
So at tree level, we've solved this, okay? We're done at tree level. Get rid of the second fact. There is no F2. There's no, there's no uh, spin correction. And you keep F1. This expression, amazingly enough, the F getting rid of the third and fourth form factors holds to all orders in perturbation theory. That's kind of miraculous. You can prove that. I'm not going to. People have proved that after. That this, this actually, this expression holds to all orders in perturbation theory. That's kind of kind of great. It really simplifies things because now you're just you're just dealing with the simple answer. You can have any number of loops you want. This is the form of the expression. Of course, your F2 is going to be different depending on the Feynman diagram. Okay, and loops are going to give us order alpha or higher, right? So now alpha is my coupling, okay, that I'm going to use here. Now you're saying, oh yeah, because we need some alpha over two pi. Okay, so I'm using alpha as the coupling and loops are going to give us order alpha or higher just by basic uh, perturbation theory. Okay. Very good. Okay, so F1, F1 does modify the original coupling. So F1 modifies the standard E A mu psi bar gamma mu psi coupling. It modifies the original coupling. Like we're getting some extra stuff. However, without F2, so without F2, G just equals two. So G equals two plus two F2 of zero. We'll call it F2 of zero because I'm, I wanna calculate the coupling to leading order in alpha. That's why I wrote zero, right? To order alpha. That's just my notation. Okay, so if you run through the calculation and you ignore F2, you find that G equals just two, which is what Dirac computed. You need that F2 correction to get the, the full answer. Does that make like intuitive sense at least? That this F2 is like the correction term. Okay, shall we compute F2, the form factor? Okay, that's it. This is the marathon now. This is the... This is the four pages of calculation on my sheet. Okay, the, the, this was all, we were all just setting up. So let's do it. Oh man, you know, it really makes me a little sad. It makes me a little sad to draw a Feynman diagram right now, but I have to because it just, it just simplifies our discussion, but it, it makes me a little sad. I just want everyone to know that, especially doing Schwinger's calc. Actually Feynman computed this two years later. So Feynman got the same answer using much simpler methods. So for what it's worth. Okay, anyways, so what is the Feynman diagram we want to compute? It's like the gods of physics were looking down on us because it turns out we only have to compute one. We only have to do one loop correction, okay? And that is the following. And it also turns out that this loop correction doesn't diverge. The, the integral doesn't diverge. Okay, so this is very nice. There's no divergent integral. That's pretty awesome. So I am mu two, we'll call it two because we want, uh, this is not tree level now. Oh, I called the tree level thing zero, right? And okay, so we'll call this one. Sorry, that just makes natural sense. So, what does it look like? I always draw, don't leave enough space for me at the top. So it looks like this. This is our standard guy, P, Q1, Q2. But where's the loop correction? The loop correction looks like this. Okay, K minus Q1 here, momentum K here after this vertex and momentum e plus k. Okay. Yeah. 
So I've given this, I've given the momentum, this guy K minus Q1, this guy gets a P, this guy gets a Q2, this guy gets a Q1, okay? Why is this K minus Q1? Because the momenta going out of the vertex is K, but I need to subtract this ingoing Q1 momenta at that vertex. Is that okay? So that's the momenta at this vertex. Then the momenta at this vertex is P plus K. Why? Because I have momenta K going in and momentum P going in. So those are the momentas at the vertices. Is that okay? I said that fast. So huzzah. Now we just do a, comp a Feynman rule, simple computation. Shall we do it? Okay. So this, so this again, to stress, is the only, this is the only G minus two graph. Okay, this is the only G minus two graph. Okay. Okay, let's do a calculation. It's actually not that bad. It's just a ton of algebra. It's it's really it's really not it's really not crazy. Okay, let's first just write down the standard amplitude. Okay, and then we're we're gonna manipulate it. So I am mu one. So at loop level, is equal to minus I e cubed. Why did I get the minus i cubed? I have three vertices, right? The two vertices where the loop meets my uh, electrons, and then the vertice from the exterior photon, right? So there's three vertices. Integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth minus i g mu alpha K minus Q1 squared plus I epsilon. Propagator, right? For the internal, uh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get three of them. I'll tell you why. Q bar Q2. Okay. Gamma nu. That just comes from that vertex factor. I P slash plus K slash plus M. Epsilon, gamma mu. These gamma mu's all come from this minus ID, right? Because the vertex factor is minus ID gamma mu, right? Okay, then I get another guy, I k slash plus m k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. We'll call this gamma alpha mu of q1. And that's our amplitude. Okay, so this guy uh, is the is the propagator from the k minus q one momenta. This guy comes from p plus k, and this guy comes from k squared minus. No, this just comes from k squared. And then I get each. I get three gammas that all come from the vertex factors. So three vertex factors and three little propagators because we have three sort of internal momenta from, from, from that internal photon. Are we okay? This is the standard form of the fermion propagator, yeah? Okay, not so bad. I just followed the rules, right? Now I'm going to do some algebra and manipulate this and put this in a nice form to integrate. Okay, so let's do that. So just doing basic algebra, I get minus e, e cubed, u bar q2, integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, gamma nu, e slash plus k slash plus m, gamma mu. Oh gosh, this denominator is small. I'm gonna write it down here. Integral d4k over two pi to the fourth 
gamma nu p slash plus k slash plus m gamma mu k slash plus m gamma nu all over the three i epsilon terms. So k minus q1 squared plus i epsilon q plus k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. This fraction is done, and this is all times u of q1. So I've just combined the fractions, that's all, and put them under a common denominator. That's all I've done. Basic algebra, I haven't really done anything crazy. Are we okay? Okay, let's integrate this bad boy, shall we? And uh, to integrate, so you're like, how do I integrate this? What the heck is going on here? Yes, to integrate this is tough. You need a very special identity. So I'll put that on the board in a second. Let me know when I can erase. You can see, this is, this is why when I use notes, it goes bad because I go fast. But for this calculation, there was way too much algebra. I was not able to do it in my head. <laughs> so I'm like, let me just be safe. I don't want to make so many errors in this because this is such an important calculation. Hopefully now it seems a little more clear. Okay, somewhat, fair enough. Okay, can I erase? Okay. Very good. Uh, I give you fair warning, the road from here until alpha over two pi is just a bunch of algebra, but we need to integrate that bad boy. So there's a famous identity that goes the integral of one over some ABC is equal to two, zero to one, dx dy dz, delta, x plus y plus z minus one times one over x a plus y b plus z z z c cubed. This is the identity we're going to use. So you're kind of like integrating over like some weird kind of cube with length one. And so in our case, what is a and b and c? Well, a is equal to k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. b is equal to p plus k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. And c is equal to k minus q1 squared plus i epsilon. So basically, it's just the denominators of the three, the three propagators. That's all a, b, and c are in our situation, OK? So according to this identity, I need to cube all of this, okay? That's why it's very annoying. So let's do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do all the algebra, but you find that xa plus yb plus zc, because we need it for this identity, equals k squared plus 2k yp minus z q1 plus yp squared plus zq1 minus x plus y m squared plus i epsilon, which I can write as k mu, I'm gonna tell you what all this means, plus yp mu minus z q1 mu squared minus some delta, plus i epsilon, where delta equals minus x y p squared plus one minus z squared m squared. Whew, sorry, it's a lot of algebra. Uh, this is what you get after you cube everything. 
I saved you all the pain. Okay, where I use this delta for convenience. Uh, it, it makes a difference later in the calculation. And uh, the, the mu's come up because these guys are all four vectors, right? Each k, each q, each p is a four vector. Okay, sometimes we forget that because we just never write the mu. They're, they have four components as they're moving through space time. Does delta say negative y p squared? Negative x y p, a p squared. Oh yeah, that's what I meant, that's what I meant. Yep, sorry. Okay. Yeah, my Zs are not good with my two, so I try and slash them too. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten confused in my own work between a two and a Z. Oh my God. The other day I'm doing a calculation and I'm like, Z just does not work here. And I'm like, and then I look at my notes and it's supposed to be a two. I'm like, damn it. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so our denominator takes on this form now. So our denominator now, once you cube it, takes on the form k squared minus delta cubed. Okay, I haven't cubed this, right? I'm just adding them and doing the algebra. And then it's going to take this form because this just equals all of this. Okay, okay. I would recommend you try all this algebra on your own and see if you get the same answer. Very good. Okay, now we have to deal with the numerator. Okay, so uh, keep this in your back pocket for the denominator. And now let's deal with the numerator, shall we? Let's deal with all that spinner stuff. Spinner stuff. Let me know when I can erase. And then, and then all it will come down to will be to plug back into this formula and integrate and we're done. That's it. Okay. Shall I do the numerator? Okay, good. So I will uh, call the numerator something that is so so sometimes people call the numerator n mu. Okay. I don't know why. I really have no idea. <laughs> I'm just gonna do that because that's what people do. And then they'll just manipulate it. Just so you're like, what is that? Mean? Okay, u bar q2, gamma u, p slash plus k slash plus m, gamma mu, k slash plus m, gamma mu, u, q1. Okay, that's our numerator. Oh man, Olga, you missed all my algebra. It's okay. I was here. Oh, okay, good, good, good. I was I was worried for you. It's like and then I just turned off the camera and like well, it's funny because one time I was teaching a class, I think to a group of high schoolers. I was I wasn't showing them anything complicated. I was they didn't know any physics. So I was just showing them like distances and stuff. And some guy walked in late and he went, his mouth dropped. It was very funny. I said, You missed out, man. Okay, whatever. Okay, this is our numerator, correct? Okay, so let's just do some algebra. Let's just multiply everything out. So I get minus two u bar q2, and then I get one big term, k slash gamma mu p slash plus k slash gamma mu k slash plus m squared gamma mu minus two m, 2k mu plus p mu mu of q1. Okay, so that's after much tedious manipulation, that's what I get. Okay, I trust you can figure it out. Now you're starting to realize, man, all of this notation is helpful now. The slash notation, imagine writing out all of these gammas and we just have tons of stuff just floating in midair. Okay, so I make the following substitution. I want k mu to shift or to be, I'll tell you what I mean, minus y p mu plus z q1 mu. Okay, I'm just relabeling it in this way, just to make the notation a little easier. 
Okay. And uh, I find that minus one half and mu, the reason I have minus one half is I want to get rid of this two. Okay. So I find that minus one half and mu equals u bar of q2 slash minus y p slash plus z q1 just adding in the shift which is going to make our integral easier gamma mu p slash plus k slash minus y p slash plus z q1 slash gamma mu k slash minus y p slash plus z one slash u of q1 plus u bar of q2 times m squared gamma mu minus 2m 2k mu minus 2yp mu plus 2z not it that's a 2 q1 mu plus p mu U of Q one. Okay, takes a lot of algebra to get here. Good luck. We're almost there. We're almost there. Just three more pages. Okay. Now you can see why I needed notes. I could not. This is just. I quickly realized this. This is too much. Just let me know when I can erase. Oh, I mean, all I'm, I'm really all, this is all math. Though. I'm not really doing any physics right now. I'm just, I'm just getting all of this into a workable form to calculate F2, right? So if someone asks you, oh yeah, I heard about, oh yeah, you're a physics student. I heard about this guy named Schwinger who computed the magnetic moment. No one's going to ask you that, but if they do, you're prepared. You say, oh, you just have to calculate F2. It's trivial. <laughs> okay, can I erase? Okay, now I'm going to do some more manipulation, okay? Surprise, surprise. I'm, now I'm going to massage this some more, get this into a usable form. It's still kind of like a mess. Okay. Shocker, I'm going to have to use the Gordon identity, just saying. I shouldn't be surprised. Okay, so I'm going to use this identity too, that uh, k mu k nu equals one fourth g mu nu k square. Okay, I'm going to use the Gordon identity. And, and, I'm going to use the fact that x plus y plus z based on our bounds of integration equals one. And I'm going to use a whole ton of algebra. That's a technical term, by the way, a whole ton of algebra. And you find that your numerator becomes this minus one half n mu equals minus one half k squared plus one minus x, one minus y, p squared plus one minus four z plus z squared over m squared. U bar of q2, gamma mu, u of q1 plus i m z, one minus C, P mu, the bar of Q2, sigma mu nu, U of Q1 plus M, Z minus Z. What the hell? Z minus, can you believe that? I'm making a mistake. Z minus two, not Z minus Z. All I was saying, X minus Y, P mu, U bar Q2. Oh, yes. U uh, of Q1. Okay. I ask, I give you the challenge to do this, get it in this form. It will take you like nine pages of algebra. 
Just saying. Okay, whatever. Even if you're like totally mystified, which you should be because I didn't show any of the steps, I got my sigma mu nu and I got my p nu. Okay, <laughs> that's all I care about in effect from the Gordon identity. And we really only care about the sigma mu nu term for the magnetic moment, okay? That's kind of like, the rest is all filler. <laughs> Seriously, it is. Well, well, all of these x, y's and z's, they're all coming from our integral, the, the way we set up the integral, right? They're not, Okay, let me know when I can do this. This is more algebra than your algebra one class, right? I think. <laughs> it's okay. You guys are all still starting. So just seeing this is a big deal. It's okay. Okay. Can I can I erase? Okay, very good. Okay, okay, so let's go back to the integral now. Now we now we did as much manipulation as possible. There's really nothing else we can do now. <laughs> so let's let's rewrite the integral. So I m mu two equals p nu mu bar of q two sigma mu nu u of q1 for i e cubed m integral 0 to 1 dx dy dz delta x plus y plus z minus 1 integral d4k over 2 pi to the 4 uh, z times 1 minus z a squared minus delta i epsilon cubed plus delta plus a ton of other terms with the other stuff that we wrote down. <laughs> Turns out this is the only important step to the magnetic moment. Okay. So all the other algebra was useless. Not really, because we can't just leave out algebra. Wow, okay. Okay, so we're there. Now we just need to compute this integral and we're done. This gives us F2. Okay, there's like two more steps to do. To get to this expression was hard, as you saw. So it's a lot of machinery, but uh, we're there. So let's, let's, let's continue. Okay. So F2, hmm, do I want to do this to P squared or I E cubed M? Okay, and this is just equal to F2, right? This integral, this extra stuff. Okay. So we're gonna to need to use another integral trick to evaluate this, that the integral d4k two pi to the fourth, one over k squared minus delta plus i epsilon cubed equals minus i over 32 pi squared delta. Okay, this is just some random, you know, there, uh, before people were able to look up integrals on the computer, people literally used to have books, thousand page books, and the title would be like integrals, that's it. And it would just be thousand pages of just integrals. And almost every theoretical physicist had that book because uh, like, like figuring this out will take you like a week. 
this <laughs> people figured it out, but they used to have these books, how to do all of these integrals. In fact, I think one of my professors who was really old gave me one copy, said, you're gonna need this. I'm like, oh, it's called Wolfram Alpha, but okay, I'll take it. I'll take it, whatever you say. Okay. Excellent. So let's write down the integral. So F2 equals alpha over pi. Where did I get the alpha from? I pulled it out of thin air. So far, have I made any reference to a coupling? No. So this whole time, this whole calculation was done to order alpha in perturbation theory, okay? In other words, I've been working to order alpha. In so remember, we wrote down the Dyson expansion, you get, and we use lambda. You get a lambda term, then you get a lambda squared term, right? Then you get a lambda cube term over three factorial, da, da, da. Okay, this whole calculation was done to the lambda, to the first term over one factorial. Okay, first order in perturbation theory, which makes sense because there's one loop. There was two loops, I'd have an alpha squared. There was three loops, I'd have an alpha uh, cubed. There's, okay, so I'm not pulling this out of thin air. This alpha was there the whole time, the coupling. Okay, so my integral becomes alpha over pi m squared, zero to one, dx dy dz, delta, x plus y plus z minus one. I'm sure this integral is also online somewhere. Okay. Z, one minus Z, the setting up what we've been computing, one minus Z squared, M squared minus X B squared, okay? Good. Phew. All right, Johnson, do this integral for me. I'm very tired. You you missed this mess of a calculation, so we'll wait. Yep. I'm good, Kyle. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, I did it. I did it. Don't worry. Okay, so you find that now the second form factor, just alpha over pi, zero to one dz, zero to one dy, zero to one. Uh, delta, uh, delta, wait a second, what did I do here? No, 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 this is fine. Zero to one dx, delta x plus y plus z minus one. It doesn't matter where I put the delta. Delta is just gonna give it one. Z over one minus z. Sorry, let me just do this better. You do some manipulation, you get alpha over pi. 0 to 1 dz, 0 to 1 minus z dy, doing the change of bounds, z over 1 minus z. Johnson can show you these steps next time before vacuum polarization if you're confused. Okay, can someone get the trumpets? Because I'm going to write down what happens when you do this integral, which is actually pretty easy. No trumpets for me? Okay, I'll, ju I'll just write it down. You get alpha over two pi. Okay. It's, it's, you're like, how? It's not that bad. Plug this into Wolfram Alpha or something and you'll get alpha over two pi. Huzzah, we did it. This was Schwinger's triumph, okay? And, Let's talk about the historical significance of this. And let's also, let's, uh, let's we, we should talk a bit about this because this was a huge deal. So remember we said that the G factor was just two, right? That's what Dirac computed, right? And, I said, oh gosh, that's really wrong. The experiment showed it was wrong. How wrong? Let's see. Take two plus alpha 
over two pi. Remember, alpha is just your standard coupling. It's some crazy number, right? Okay. What do you get? We get 2.00232. That was the correction. That matched experiment. Isn't that amazing? That the correction was so minor, but, but okay, how much work did quantum field theory, how much work did we have to do to get alpha or two pi? But quantum field theory gives you the precise correction. I mean, that's just insane to me. How does that even work? I'm shocked that this even gives you the answer. Uh, so, so a lot of experimental particle physicists have spent careers measuring G, okay? They've spent careers measuring G. So should I, I'll tell you what G is now, okay? So what is G? So first of all, G has been measured up to four loop level, theoretically. It's been calculated up to four loop level now. So we did one loop level. Schwinger did one loop level. Theorists have gone up to four loop level using computers and other things. It gets too complicated to do on paper, okay? And uh, experimenters, the, the, the last time I checked, the number for G is 2.002319, uh, 19304361, dot, dot, dot. There's another like 30 digits. That's how precise. Notice 2.00232, 2.00219. So it's a perfect match to what Schwinger calculated. And so what this told people is yes, QFT has physical consequences. That quantum field theory, this algorithm of, of, of perturbation theory, of Dyson expansions, right? This ability to order alpha and the coupling, computing the diagram uh, works. It works. Pretty neat, right? Very good. Okay, uh, before we wrap up today, I'm going to tell you what we've covered so far, because I think it's a natural stopping point to discuss. And I'm going to throw all the buzzwords at you that you should know now. Okay. So here are all the chapters I've assigned. Lancaster, but we'll go, we'll go Weinberg. So Weinberg was just chapter 14 on soft theorems, right? which will be very important for us. Srednicki, I assigned three chapters, 10, 11, 12. Z, we looked at 1.8, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, to read about the mattress of quantum fields, right? And Lancaster, Blundell, we looked at 0, 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, Appendix B. 36, 37, 38, 15, 22, 31, 32, 33, 34, 41, 40, 13, 14, and 39. We've done a lot of stuff. So I'll tell you all the topics that I expect some familiarity with, just so we're all on the same page. So symmetries, right? Continuous symmetries, like Noether's theorem, discrete symmetries, right? Char CPT theorem, right? With charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. I expect you to know some complex analysis, how to do a contour integral. Uh, hopefully, I expect you to know what a Lagrangian is. When I say I expect you to know, I just I'm saying this. Just be familiar because we're done. This is a natural stopping point because after this, we're going to ramp up. We'll be done with QFT and then we're going to start doing, I'm going to start introducing you to some research problems. So I just want to make sure we all sort of know what's happening, right? And if you have, if you're confused, go back and read about it. It's okay to be confused. It's fine. Uh, deriving the Feynman rules. Obviously, I hope you are familiar with an action, minimizing the action. Can you do that process? By the way, Kyle, I had to do a presentation on the Feynman rules. 
Um, but I slept over the class, like the last hour conference. So if you want to, I can do it tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. We, we, we didn't have Mansur go yet either. So we'll do two QFT tomorrow morning. Or tomorrow morning, our time, tomorrow evening for you. Okay, canonical quantization. So now if I show you how to canonically quantize strings, it should be fairly straightforward. And I mean that, it's really not a big deal. The S matrix, I am, I, okay, big secret. I have been starting to work out a very ambitious problem uh, it, that is kind of crazy, but it has to do a lot with symmetries of the S matrix. So yeah, I think that's the problem I'm gonna have you guys work on, but I, I have to work out some of the kinks. I've been making a lot of errors. Okay, interactions, right? So phi to the fourth theory. The word identity, word identities in general, which we use today, when we said the photon was off shell and we took out that P mu. Okay, QED, spinners, the Dirac equation, generating functionals, the basics of gauge theory, basics of renormalization, so like Pauli Villers regularization, that kind of stuff, ETC, okay? But that's the basic flavor of everything we've done, which is a lot. It's a lot. I'm not saying you're going to be experts at everything, okay? I'm not expecting that. I'm just saying know the skeletal structure. Okay, anyways, to wrap up, I just felt like that was, today was a natural stopping point, right? Because we're done with QED. We've sort of, we've sort of finished what people cover in like almost a semester of QFT1, kind of. Usually this is sort of one of the last calculations, then you do like renormalization. So we still have a few more classes, but we're, we basically covered almost all of QFT1, just other than vacuum polarization, which is what Johnson is gonna cover. Okay, very good. Uh, I hope this was somewhat inspirational for you because this really is one of the most amazing calculations to learn about as a physics student. And I will, I'll tell you, just so you don't feel bad, I have probably looked at this calculation at least 20 times. And uh, now I can work it out really well. Okay, so, I, you know, being stuck is life. Uh, I'm stuck 99% of the time. I am. I've said that a lot. So don't feel bad if you're very confused. That's fine. Just get the gist for now and know what to look for. And when you go read about it, then you'll sort of have signposts, right? That's what these lectures are about, giving you signposts, okay? But the math was very brutal today. I, I will say that. Okay, tomorrow, those of you in our GR, it's like this is the best physics weekend ever because I'm gonna derive the Einstein equations and that you will understand 100%, okay? I guarantee it because the way I've done it, I've done it very simply and we have the machinery only thing I ask, if you are still unfamiliar with uh, deriving from an action, please watch the lecture I gave on that, because I actually think that was one of my best lectures, if I do say so myself. And that will give you a very good idea of what, why we use an action, how does the calculation work, okay? Which is, which, so tomorrow when I say, oh, you threw out the boundary term. Oh, uh, this is just, uh, delta is just any perturbation, so it goes out. You know, that will make sense to you. Okay, any questions for me before I hand it over to Johnson? Okay, okay, good. Watch, watch the lecture on what? Uh, on the principle of least action. I don't remember what number that was. Oh. Uh, I can find it and put it in the chat while Johnson goes, but it was, it's on YouTube. I don't remember what number. I know my hair was very long. That's all I remember at that time. Uh, that's it. So I, I'll, I'll find it, but I would recommend giving that a watch before tomorrow. So everything is more clear. Because the way, the way I'm gonna stop recording, but the way Einstein derived it is very, 